Welcome to, or welcome back to Wrong Sports. And when I started this channel over three years ago, I was really interested in smaller program football, but that led me down the rabbit hole of finding out about well-known Division I college basketball programs that also had really well-known or really good football programs at one point. In previous episodes, I covered the end of the University of San Francisco Don's football program and the entire program at the University of Santa Clara. So I figured, let's stay in California. So over these next two episodes, I'll be covering two California colleges that had top-level college football programs that eventually met their demise. And yes, I will be covering more in the future, so don't worry. In this first episode, I'll be covering the St. Mary's College of California Gales and their football program that would be around for over a hundred years but also ended their program multiple times, and one final time about 20 years ago. But before I get to that, make sure as always you subscribe to the channel below, and of course, make sure that you like this video and share this video with other college football fans. Also, check out the Patreon, my podcast, or check out my social media, which is all in the description below. St. Mary's College of California started in 1863 in San Francisco and then would move to the San Francisco Bay Area in or near Oakland, California shortly thereafter. The college would be in the San Francisco Bay Area until 1928, and then they moved to where they currently are in Moraga, California. These changes coincided with financial issues, which would all cause changes for the football team, which we will be talking about very shortly, so just remember that. But I mention all of those moves because it would coincide with the St. Mary's College football team, as they would start in 1892 just after they moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. They would only play football for a very short time at seven years, as it was either a financial issue or the fact that the school is still very small, that they wouldn't field the team anymore and soon stop playing in 1899. I'm not sure what schools they played, but they won seven games and only lost six. After only eight years though, they got back on the field to start playing rugby, and from 1907 to 1914, they would play rugby, posting a 28-33-7 and record. But like most squads on the West Coast, they would eventually get back into gridiron American football, and do that in 1915. The team would be coached by David C. McAndrew, who was a player and graduate of Dartmouth at the turn of the century. He would move west though at the start of the 1900s, and he coached a few local high schools in the Oakland area, there weren't many schools playing American football in the first decade of the 1900s, especially ones out west, so a lot of really good eastern football players moved west to get jobs, and that was probably the main reason why he got this job. I don't have full schedules for the first few years, but they did have a winning record in 1916, playing against teams like USC and Cal. The next year, they would then have an 8-1-1 record and being named the California College Champions. But just as the 1920s started, St. Mary's would quickly fall behind USC and Stanford, who were also just starting back their football program in 1919. The bottom would fall out though in 1920, as St. Mary's went 0-3, including a 127 to nothing loss to Cal. And before this season could even end, the president of the school ended the football season early to regroup for next year. After that terrible season, the school, which at this point only had 125 students and occupied one building, would hire a new coach for their football team. The guy they hired was very young, as he was only one year out of graduating from Notre Dame, and he played on the 1916-1917 and on Newt Rockney's first undefeated season in 1919. His name was Edward Madigan, but he always went by his childhood nickname of Slip. When Madigan got in front of the president of the school at the time, Brother Gregory, the president thought he was a student applying for the gig. But since Brother Gregory knew every student on campus and he didn't recognize this guy, he knew that he was different from the others that applied or coached at the school. Madigan would go through his whole thing and sold himself to Brother Gregory on his Notre Dame background, which at this point had gained some media attention after their second undefeated season in 1920. Brother Gregory would be sold on the 25-year-old Slip Madigan and give him the job, which paid $1,200 a year, and it was not only coaching football, but also coaching baseball and basketball, as well as teaching law and economics. When he got to campus, he realized his team wasn't half bad either, but the team was only 17 players. But after he taught them the ways of Newt Rockney, including training and Notre Dame plays, the team would shine. The 1921 season started immediately with a success. Even though they lost again to the defending Rose Bowl champions, the Cal Bears, they only gave up 21 points, which was a 100-point improvement from the previous year. With that success, Madigan would lead the team to a 4-3 record, and they would play all of these games on the road too, 
as they didn't have a home stadium yet, or a home field. After that first season, Madigan was looking to improve his team, as well as get them some more press. To improve the team, he went out and recruited the area. He went to the working class neighborhoods of the San Francisco Valley, as well as go out to the farms to recruit big linemen there. Most of these guys he recruited probably would have never played college football or gone to college, so Madigan used his salesmanship to sell them on St. Mary's, as well as offer them a scholarship of sorts. Now, I'm not fully sure where he got all the money for these scholarships, but as the team got better on the field, that question wasn't asked much, and I'll get more into that later too. So now with step one done and him getting new recruits, he went out to get his team more press. He did that by scheduling two games halfway across the Pacific Ocean in Hawaii. Hawaii had just become a U.S. territory and were knowledgeable of American football due to the U.S. Navy and Army on the islands. Because of this, Hawaii, as well as U.S. officials, were looking to schedule a few holiday games for the locals and for the servicemen there. Since San Francisco was also a spot for many Navy boats to dock, Madigan probably heard it from them and got his team on a boat at the end of the 1922 season to play on the islands. They would play two games there, one against a Hawaiian All-Star team, which they won, and the second was versus a Navy team, which they would lose. The trip was a once-in-a-lifetime trip, because again, nobody was doing this at this point. But that good season would just be a precursor for one of his best in 1924. This was Slip Madigan's first team that got onto the front pages of newspapers more, and especially with one big event and game. The game was an early November matchup between them and USC. USC was in the Pacific Coast Conference, but after Stanford refused to play the Trojans due to supposed infractions that Stanford and Cal and others thought USC was guilty of, USC was looking for an opponent. And I actually went over this whole disagreement that these teams had with USC in my conference talk all about the original Pacific Coast Conference. I'll put a link above and below for that. And due to the supposed infractions that Stanford and Cal thought USC was guilty of, they didn't want to play them. And thus, USC had an open date, and Madigan and St. Mary's would step up, and USC would approve. The game was played at the massive Memorial Coliseum in Los Angeles in front of 30,000 fans, and that didn't deter St. Mary's at all, as they won this game 14-10 and ended the year 8-1. The 1924 season was also the kickoff to a great decade-plus run, too. The 1925 season would continue that with another winning record, as they would also have their first-ever player be picked to be an All-American, and their center and D-lineman, Larry Betancourt. And Betancourt was a prolific punt blocker, as he managed to score 12 touchdowns in his college career, all off punt blocks. Betancourt would also be inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame as well, and on this team during the mid-1920s was Red Strader. He was a tough fullback that would also be on the St. Mary's coaching squad in the 1930s, and you'll be hearing more about him too. But from 1924 to 1928, the team was 38-9-2, including an unbeaten 1926 season where they finally beat the California Bears. The winning came at a great time too, as the team would finally get a home stadium in Kizar Stadium. I have mentioned Kizar Stadium before in my discontinued about Santa Clara, and you can check that out also in the description below. But St. Mary's was actually the first school to play their home games at this stadium. The 1929 season was one of their best, as they won 8-0-1, as they had a scoreless tie with Cal at the beginning of the season, and they only gave up six points all season. But before I get to the 1930s, I gotta mention one big thing that the school would be going through. With the school doing so well in sports and especially football, they were bringing in more students every year through the 1920s. That was bringing in more money and attention, but the school was still very small. They were only running out of one building, remember, and their worry would get worse when a fire struck and severely damaged that building they would be forced to move and choose to move further east to a small town called Moranga at the end of 1928. And financial difficulties would hit the school as soon as they moved in 1928 and 1929, but after donations, and especially donations from backers of Coach Madigan and Coach Madigan himself, and I'll get more into that too later, the school was able to make it in that new town where they still are to this day. So now the 1930s are off and running, and St. Mary's would be at their best here, but Madigan was still looking for his team to be bigger, 
he would routinely call his friend and mentor Newt Rockney for advice on this matter. And since Newt Rockney was known to never want to schedule games against his former players and friends, he instead suggested that if Madigan wanted St. Mary's to be big time, that they had to play in New York City, like Notre Dame had done so many times. Madigan would manage to get a game scheduled versus New York City powerhouse Fordham in the Polo Grounds. This was big time, and Slip was so excited for the game that he was already starting to sell travel packages in the summer, which consisted of train tickets, hotel, and tickets to other parties. And none of this madness about heading to New York City messed up the season as the St. Mary's team would go 6-1, and one, and as soon as they finished that seventh game, coaches, fans, and media boarded the St. Mary's Fordham Express to New York City. And the trip would be an epic adventure in and of itself, because Madigan had over 150 alumni on board, with a few dozen sports writers from all over California, and some from all over the country that they would pick up along the way. And when the Express arrived in New York City, Madigan sent the team off to a hotel outside of Manhattan while he partied with everyone else aboard. One particular party happened the night before the game, as everyone on board partied with sports great Babe Ruth as well as others, and the party went late into the night. And when this game started, it was looking like those big parties were distracting Slip Madigan and his team on the field, as St. Mary's would fall behind 12-0. But then in the fourth quarter, St. Mary's scored three times to win 20-12 in a stunning upset. St. Mary's would end the season 8-1, but unfortunately, just after that first game in New York City, Madigan's friend and mentor, Newt Rockney, would die. Madigan took the death really hard, as most of his friends and alumni and former players did, and he would start to have ulcers more frequently. It was also written that Madigan had these ulcers come about due to his fiery ways of coaching and partying after the game. But whatever the case, this would affect Madigan's time at St. Mary's. After the trip to New York City, St. Mary's was able to schedule some teams to come out west, like Alabama and SMU, as they came out in the 1932-1933 season, which would build up St. Mary's for a fantastic 1934 season. The team was led by a great line in All-American pick John Yezerski, and by their end Ed Erdelatz. They had won seven games and were the kings of San Francisco. After beating Santa Clara and the University of San Francisco, this was their strongest start to a decade, as they went 35-10-2 from 1930 to 1934. But even with all the winning, this school was having some financial troubles, which would continue throughout the 1930s, as the school wouldn't be able to supplement their athletic department, which in turn put Madigan on his own island to get money, not only for himself, but for his teams. Not sure when this started, but Madigan was paid not only through the school, and remember, he was only getting like a $1,500 salary at this point, but he was also getting some money through a share of ticket gates. And when St. Mary's started to get better, ticket gates would start to rise, and with that, Madigan was able to get more money. And when the school couldn't afford to pay Madigan, they just told him to take more money out of the gates, and that's what he started to do. The most egregious example of this was after a 1936 game versus Fordham, as Madigan went home with a check for $38,824.15. This check was St. Mary's total share of the gate receipts, and Madigan was supposed to take his cut and then give the rest to the school. But because the college had fallen way behind in paying him, he ended up with most, if not all of it. In addition, this would make him one of the highest paid coaches in the country while the school he was coaching at was barely hanging on financially. The end of the 1930s would bring a sort of decline. I say sort of because they were still pretty good, as from 1935 to 1937, they were 15, 8, and 5, but that wasn't nearly as good as the 10 years previous. Then in 1938, after a 5-2 and two record and an upset win over top 10 ranked rival Santa Clara, St. Mary's would be invited to their first bowl game at the Cotton Bowl, but they were given no chance to win this game as they played Texas Tech, who were coming in this game 10-0 and ranked number 11. But like other games that took place on the road, Madigan got his team ready, and they turned over Texas Tech eight times to win the game 20-14. That bowl game would be the last big game for Madigan, as he would coach the team through the 1939 season, going 24-14-6 from 1935 to 1939. 
And as the 1939 season ended, word was going around that this might be it for Slip Madigan. And it would be official, as he would leave the school a few weeks into 1940. There are a few theories for him leaving. First is his health, as he was suffering ulcers for years, but it was getting really bad. So bad that he missed a few games. One game in particular was the final game of the 1939 season, where Madigan was confined to his bed and couldn't coach. But get this, due to a bet by Madigan that he had with a newspaper columnist about St. Mary's beating Fordham, which St. Mary's didn't, the writer could direct the last game. Now, that didn't mean he could coach, he could just direct it. So he could kind of call some plays, but otherwise Madigan's top assistant, Red Strader, would coach the game and St. Mary's would still win, 40 to seven. So it was clear that his health issues were a problem Another reason I read about was a rumor that Madigan actually started, which was that he was fired due to a rivalry he had with the new president. No one at St. Mary's though confirmed his theory, but the best theory was that Madigan was let go because football had gotten really out of hand in the late 1930s. It was affecting the college's academic life, and this would be seen in 1939, as more than a dozen football players were not eligible to play due to academics. In addition, the team had an effect on the school's religious character, as most of the athletes he recruited were not Catholic either. Finally, Madigan was told by the school that he was no longer going to receive a percentage of the gate receipts, which was kind of strange, but I'm pretty sure the school knew that he was making a bunch of money off of that. And once Madigan heard that, he knew that he was seeing the end of his time there. So now with Madigan gone, St. Mary's didn't look far as they elevated Red Strader to be the new coach. And Strader came in with a lot to do with very little, because like I mentioned, a dozen players were suspended due to academics already. But even with this complete overhaul, Strader was still able to get them to a 5-3 record in 1940, and then a 5-4 record in 1941. But Strader was not happy pretty quickly, as his team was not able to get many dates at Kizar Stadium, which was starting to become an issue because now there were three teams, University of San Francisco, Santa Clara, and St. Mary's, plus high schools that were using it. Due to that, most of St. Mary's games would be on Sunday, which may have hurt their ticket sales this year, but would definitely hurt their ticket sales in the future. This isn't the main reason why Strader would leave the school. He would actually leave because of the breakout of World War II. The school and Strader himself were drafted into the fight. Strader would have to leave the school in early 1942 to be in the Navy for nearly two years, and St. Mary's would be used for the wartime effort as it was used by the United States Navy for the training of pilots. This would help to keep the school running during a difficult time, and it also helped to keep sports running. Since football would happen during World War II, St. Mary's had to hire a new coach, and since their best coach, Slip Madigan, was a Notre Dame alumni, they went with another Notre Dame alumni from his time in James Phelan. Phelan had been a player at Notre Dame from 1915 to 1917, the same time as Madigan, but had then gone off to Europe for World War I, and after the war, he immediately got into coaching. First at Missouri in 1920, then to Purdue, and then to Washington, where he coached them to the Rose Bowl in 1937. Since he was too old for any fighting in World War II, he took the job of football coach as well as athletic director at St. Mary's in 1942. The team would have a pretty normal schedule in 1942 as they would have 10 games and they continued their travels east as they played Duquesne to a tie in Pittsburgh and then they lost to Fordham in New York City. But 1942 would prove to be their best during this wartime as they won 6-3 during that year but then fell to 2-5 in 1943 and then they went 0-5 in, in a very short 1944 season. But even though there were some down years like that 1944 season, they would see the rise of a great player in Herman Wiedemeyer. Wiedemeyer was originally from the big island of Hawaii, but then moved to Honolulu where he would become a sports star and is still talked about to this day as one of the greatest athletes to ever come out of Hawaii. He was actually living and going to school not far from Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attacked it in 1941, and he would stay on the island to finish high school as he would win the Hawaii football state title in 1941 and 1942. And he was recruited to go to Ohio State and Notre Dame, 
but he chose St. Mary's, as it was closer to his home and he was still able to do his service requirements. And Herman would make an immediate impact, as he led the team in total offense in 1943, but due to the war going on, he may have gotten more playing time due to the roster changing a lot. This was seen in 1944, because Wiedemeyer doesn't show up at all in the scorecards, and I don't really have any stats on him either. But he would be back for the 1945 season, where he would shine. He would not only lead the team, but was second nationally in passing yards. His talents helped St. Mary's to a 7-0 start, before they lost a close late-season game to UCLA. Wiedemeyer would also get Heisman votes for his great season, which was a first for a St. Mary's player. But even with the loss, St. Mary's was invited to New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl. Oklahoma A&M were undefeated and were ranked in the top 10. But that didn't matter to Herman Wiedemeyer, who would throw a touchdown pass and lateral for another one to give St. Mary's a 14-13 lead at half. But after the half, it was all Oklahoma A&M, as they outscored them 20 to nothing to win. That game, though, would help to further the spotlight of St. Mary's and also made Wiedemeyer into a bigger star. He would have another great season in 1946 by having an average of over 100 total yards per game and lead St. Mary's to a 6-2-1 record and another bowl invite this time to the Oil Bowl versus Georgia Tech. That game resulted in another loss, but Wiedemeyer got more Heisman votes again in 1947. The 1947 season would fall off a cliff early, as the team was 2-0, including a win over Hawaii in Wiedemeyer's first college game in his hometown. But then the team would go and finish the season 1-7. Wiedemeyer would graduate after the season and be drafted ninth overall. His NFL career would be short though unfortunately due to injury, but he is more well known for his off the field work as a businessman and also actor as he performed on the original Hawaii Five-0 for eight years. And along with their star player leaving, their coach James Phelan would also leave after this season. He would go on to the new AAFL where he would coach for a couple of years. But St. Mary's didn't go on a cross-country search for their new coach this time. Instead, they went in the city for Joe Verducci and hired him. Verducci was a California native and went to University of California where he played for them in the mid-1930s. During the war, he would stay in the San Francisco Bay Area, coaching the Alameda Coast Guard, and his Coast Guard team would actually play St. Mary's during the war years, and they would use the same stadium. The Verducci era wasn't that great though, as in 1948 they went 4-6, and six, scoring less points than any other season in the 1940s, the only exception being the shortened 1944 season. The 1949 season was even more of the same, as the team went 3-6-1, and, and even though they did score more points, it was clear they weren't the same team under this new coach. On top of that, it was looking pretty clear that Joe Verducci was looking to get out of St. Mary's too, and he would officially do that in early February 1950 as he left to become the head coach and athletic director at San Francisco State. I say that he wanted to get out of there because according to newspaper reports, St. Mary's was pretty blindsided by him leaving and before St. Mary's could announce he was resigning, he was already at San Francisco State working. And this whole Verducci leaving the school was a pretty bad omen for things to come, but they would power on as the 1950s would kick off, and they would have to hire another new coach, and they would hire a relatively unknown coach in Joe Roots. Roots was a Notre Dame player in the late 1930s, and there you go again with Notre Dame players. He would go off to war and come back in 1945 where he would play for the new AAFL for two years before becoming an assistant at St. Mary's. He was only 36, and he fit a lot of St. Mary's coaching requirements like being a Notre Dame alumni, as well as being a St. Mary's assistant, and he was a first-time coach, so you know he was pretty cheap, and that's what they were looking for at this point. The 1950 season would be like the previous few years. They did manage to schedule a game versus Southern Power Georgia in late September, but the game would only draw 7,000 fans and would see an upset of sorts, as St. Mary's ended up tying them 7-7. St. Mary's would only be able to get two wins that season, but they did have another positive on their team in their running back, John Henry Johnson, who was a highly touted high school player coming in. So that was a big deal for this team, as they were still getting highly touted recruits to come come in. But even with that positive, once November hit, it was rock bottom for this team, as they were 2-6-1 and one and had two more games both at home. Their first one was versus their rival Santa Clara, 
who were also quickly sliding into pretty bad territory. And usually these games drew 25 to 30,000, but in 1950 this matchup could only muster 11,000 fans. But they saw a messy game, where Santa Clara would win 9 to nothing. The final game of the season was a perfect crescendo, as Villanova was coming to town. This game happened because St. Mary's went to Philly the year before, and this game would happen under rainy and muddy conditions, which hampered the game as it ended with Villanova winning 13-7. But how I introduced this game as it was a perfect crescendo to a terrible season was because due to the weather, this game only had 200 fans in the stadium. Yes, 200. Villanova was guaranteed $10,000 for showing up to go to this cross-country trip. St. Mary's did have the money to pay them, but this was a game where they were thinking 10,000 people would show up to see an Eastern team, but instead they stayed away and they lost big on it. And it seems like the school thought so too, as quickly after that game, on January 4th, 1951, St. Mary's announced it was abandoning its intercollegiate football and baseball programs for the duration of the national emergency resulting from the Korean War. St. Mary's wouldn't be getting any federal attention and help like they did a few years earlier during World War II, so with more college-age men going off to war, this seemed like a good option for them. They also cited academics at the school rising and it becoming tougher to be competitive in football because of that. I mentioned John Henry Johnson because he would end up leaving St. Mary's. He went to Arizona State where he would play two more years as a running back and defensive back and was a dangerous punt returner. He would also famously play for the San Francisco 49ers in the million dollar backfield just a few years later before being voted into the NFL Hall of Fame. So now St. Mary's football was discontinued for a second time and you would think that that was it. But actually, there's more to the story. As in the mid-1960s, many students and alumni started to talk about bringing back the football team. The team and its history was beloved on campus, and Madigan would be well known on the campus too, due to a gymnasium bearing his name. It wasn't immediate though, as more than two decades later in 1968, the team would be back for the third time to the football field. Except the first two years were a little different because they were basically a club team, so they wouldn't be officially a team and officially back with a varsity team until 1970. That would now be back in the college division. These are schools that are basically at the D2 and D3 level right now, so they didn't really give out many scholarships, and St. Mary's gave out a few, maybe a dozen at this point, with a bunch of financial aid packages. So now with the team back, they would go out and hire their first official coach, and they went where else? A Notre Dame alum in Leo McKillop. And Coach McKillop would come to St. Mary's knowing their history, but it being very different. Like they weren't playing at the massive Kizar Stadium anymore. They would instead play at a bunch of places and fields until they got a new stadium called St. Mary's Stadium for the 1973 season. And I'm mentioning this because this is pretty much the only good thing or big thing that happened during McKillop's four years at the school, as he would only win a total of 12 games and he had no winning records, but he did manage to win three games at the new stadium in the 1973 season. After he left, they would elevate their top assistant, Jim McDonald, who besides going nine and 20 over his three years as head coach, he would leave the team as they started playing at the division three level in the NCAA. This was when the NCAA transitioned into the divisions we have now. But St. Mary's would only be Division Three until 1980, moving up to Division Two as an independent there. The 1980s would also be another strong decade for them, as they had seven winning records during that time. Their best team during this time was in 1988, under their coach Craig Rundle. St. Mary's would go 10-0, but due to their strength of schedule, which was very low, they were unranked and they didn't get invited to the 16-team Division II tournament, which was unfortunate. But they would keep on winning and keep winning into the 1990s, which would also be the start of St. Mary's moving back up to Division I, but Division I AA, which is now known as the FCS. The reason for the move up to Division I was because the NCAA passed new rules saying that colleges and universities needed to have all their athletic teams at the same level. And since St. Mary's had their basketball team at Division I, they needed to move their football team up to that level too. This was the same thing that killed off Santa Clara's football team, and I thought that that would happen here too, but no, St. Mary's would actually be back at the Division I level, but it was a little different from their time before in the 1950s. 
And there were a lot of rules and regulations that you had to abide by as a team and an athletic program to stay at the Division I level. And since St. Mary's had to have their football team at the Division I level, since their basketball team was up there, they also had to abide by those rules, except they ended up going by the Pioneer Football League rules, which was they didn't really give out any scholarships. They gave out some partial scholarships here and there, or a lot of financial aid. It's also kind of what the Ivy League does, except the Ivy League really really doesn't give out any scholarships for athletics whatsoever. And also, I'm not entirely sure why St. Mary's wasn't in the Pioneer Football League. They would have fit really well. I'm not, I'm not sure why they weren't there. But they ended up filling out their schedule with a lot of Pioneer Football League schools, as well as teams from the Big West and a few from the D2 level. That resulted in some more winning years in 1993, 1994, 1995, and 1996. But that also resulted in their schedule being weak, since they played some Division II teams. With that, and the fact that the D1AA tournament only invited 16 teams, they weren't invited to it ever. But eventually the winning would run out, as their 11th season winning streak would end in 1997, and they wouldn't have a winning season to end the decade and century. In the new century though, they would hire a new coach to get them out of the slump. They would choose Davidson head coach Tim Landis, who built up Davidson, which was D1, then dropped to D3, then came back to D1 in the late 1980s. And all of these moves Davidson did made them non-scholarship for most of Landis's time there. So coming to St. Mary's would pretty much be the same thing. And it was looking like a pretty good hire, as St. Mary's immediately turned around in 2000, finishing fourth in the FCS in rushing offense, and they also had a winning record at 6-5. and five. Landis would keep them winning over the next three years, but they could never get over that six-win threshold, and Tim Landis would leave after going 18-16 and 16 over three years. Besides the winning records, another good thing Landis did was that he improved ticket sales. St. Mary's had a much smaller stadium than they used to have, as it only held about 5,500 people, and when Landis got there in 2000, they had a total of 44 season tickets sold. But as Landis began winning, the season tickets rose to just above 500. Even with this, they were still running at a deficit with this team, but fought on with the 2003 season and a new coach in Vincent White. He was working for the University of Utah when St. Mary's got to him and made him the coach of the football team. And White had a completely different offense than Landis did, and it showed as their offense only managed to get 15 points per game. The defense, meanwhile, was really terrible, as they were giving up just over 40 points per game. And due to this, they went 1-11, and the fans in the stands dwindled as their final home game had 1,200 fans. Throughout the winter and the spring, coaching and recruiting went on as usual. While behind closed doors, St. Mary's trustees and college administrators discussed how to balance the budget. The football team would hit the chopping block as St. Mary's announced the dissolution of the college football program. Some of the costs were jerseys, travel, and coaching salaries, but along with that, the school did give out 16 $32,850 full-ride scholarships. This is what would put them over the threshold to make them a Division I school, but that wasn't too many scholarships to compete against the bigger D1 AA schools, as they were mostly giving out around 50 scholarships. And this is also probably why St. Mary's couldn't be in a conference, because they couldn't adhere to the conference rules. They probably couldn't adhere to the rules of the Pioneer Football League. That's why I was wondering before why they weren't in that conference. They probably couldn't adhere to the conference rules, because St. Mary's ended up giving out scholarships, and a lot of PFL teams never did. The end of the program was a shock, as many players came into the locker room over the summer to see no pads, no helmets, or other equipment. And coaches were not told either until late July or early August. Coach Vincent White was pissed, as he said he felt betrayed and lied to by St. Mary's, and he was in tears at a press conference after the announcement. The 14 new recruits that White had recruited to the school were now out of a place to play, and it was too late for them to transfer, so I'm pretty sure they were given the financial aid or the partial scholarship for that year, but it doesn't seem like they were given any more than the one year. And it really isn't shocking that St. Mary's officials and the presidents voted to have the football team discontinued because it made the most sense. Since that ruling in the early 1990s from the NCAA, it caused about 30 football teams to go away. So I was surprised when I saw that St. Mary's went another 11 years at the D1AA level when they really weren't giving out any scholarships. And this is generally how the end of an athletic team comes. But when St. Mary's got into the 1970s and the NCAA split into three divisions like we have now, there were a lot of different standards and it seemed to have thrown St. Mary's into confusion as to how to balance all of these athletic programs. 
St. Mary's, though, did play in every division, which is pretty insane, too. But it also was insane because they couldn't find the correct place for them to play. It seems like St. Mary's would have done really good at the D2 or D3 level, especially the D2 level, since they gave out some scholarships. It would have made more sense for them, but I guess they didn't want to sacrifice their basketball program, which was starting to get really good. Plus, the basketball teams cost about a quarter of football teams' costs. And for a private school, especially a small private school like St. Mary's, they really didn't want to spend a whole bunch of money on a football team that wasn't winning and not making them any money. But before I go, the best team in my mind for St. Mary's over this whole run has to be the 1929 season. They went 9-0-1, and they shut out nine teams, which is just crazy. And the second best team in my mind has to be the other undefeated team in the 1988 team. They have a winning record all time, as they have a 380-295-22 record, which is a 56% winning percentage. So that's still really good for a football team, especially for one that lasted as long as they did and moved around as much as they did. But thank you so much for hanging out with me on Discontinued, a brand new episode all about the St. Mary's Gales football team. Thank you so much again for hanging out with me. As always, if you like this video, please give it a like below. Also share with other college football fans. And of course, before you go, make sure you subscribe to the channel below. And you can also check out my social media, my podcast, and help out the channel on my Patreon. All of that is in the description below. And check out my playlists too to the side. And again, thank you so much. Have a great day. More discontinued videos coming soon.